On the first day of love, which the madhouse brought to me, an autumn book hall. Hello fellow humans and welcome to the madhouse. Today is the 1st of December so I'm now going to say it, Merry Christmas. I'm feeling kind of festive. I'm not sure why, but I'm really getting into it. So I thought I would share that festivity and, well, today film a bookish video, but there's far more Christmassy ones coming up, I can promise you that. Some might involve being very drunk with friends and making gingerbread houses. Who knows? Well, I do. You'll find out. So without further ado, let's begin. One of the first books I bought was Masquerade by Terry Pratchett, because I had a copy of this, a small paperback one that I could fit in my pocket, and for some reason, I don't know, my brother borrowed it, well, I know why he borrowed it, and I let him do it, but he can't find it now, and nor can I. So my plan when I get home is to beat him over the head with this until his brains run out of his ears. Obviously, I have read this one already. It's a satire and parody of the Phantom of the Opera, which is a fantastic musical and a fantastic book if you ever get the chance um, to read it and watch it. You really should watch it, if nothing else. The music's phenomenal. And it features Granny Weatherwax Nanyog and a new witch, Agnes. Agnes Knit, to be precise, who is a fantastic character and an excellent um, replacement for Magrat while she's busy being queen. Whoops, spoilers for one of the earlier books. Celevi. It's very, very funny and just as clever and twisted as you might expect. The Positronic Man by Asimov and Silverberg. I've talked about this one often enough. <laughs> it's a very, very clever, very, very human book, despite being about an android. I've mentioned this one as well. Millie Maruta's Animal Kingdom, a colouring book adventure. Now, I'm not too sure I believe in the whole mindfulness thing. But I have to say, I have been enjoying some of this, if I can find one that I've done. Because I've cut a lot of them out to stick on my walls downstairs. Mm. That one's quite nice. It's just nice sometimes to sit through and do this colouring. And every single one in this book is part of the animal kingdom. It's very natural, very calming. It's quite nice. There is This Book Is Gay by James Dawson. Which, as you might guess, is a gay book. It's not a fiction book. It's about what it means to be part of the LGBT community. And speaking of, it now ticks off another tally in my plan to read more diversely. Because James Dawson recently came out as trans. He is still using his male name and pronouns until he's finished his transition. But he is female. Well, she... yes. And... I find that fascinating, really, because it might say something about the nature of identity that perhaps we don't want to embrace it fully while we're younger. We're slightly scared of doing it, and we spent ages talking, well, putting another identity upon ourselves that we feel more comfortable with, but isn't quite a true fit. And then as you get older, you start to realise, I can't lie anymore. It, it's fascinating, and I'm looking forward to reading this book, but apparently it's very, very funny, and it has some interesting illustrations in there too, if I can just find one of them. Well, illustrations, I mean cartoons. Some of them are funny. There is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Hatwood. This is one of my favourite science fiction books. I absolutely love it. It's so very, very clever, and Offred is a very real kind of character, but the fact that we never learn her true name also means that she's an abstract character where she could be anyone and everyone in such a position, not just this, this character. An archetype, if you will, but a believable one, which is very difficult to achieve, so hats off to Atwood. But very post-apocalyptic, very good. A definitive dystopian novel. And another Margaret Atwood, there is Curious Pursuits, Occasional Writing. Now, I bought this purely because of Margaret Atwood's name on it. I know that's probably not the best reason to buy one, but I like her stuff. Now, why is... I'll read the blurb then. Why is this book called Curious Pursuits? Q 
Curious describes both my habitual state of mind, a less kind word would be nosy, as well as the subject matter of some of these writings. Like Alice, I've become curiouser and curiouser myself, and the world has done the same. Another way of putting it, if something doesn't arouse my curiosity, I'm not likely to write about it. Though perhaps curious as a word carries too light a weight, my curiosities are, I hope, not idle ones. Passionate might have been more accurate. However, it would have given a wrong impression and disappointed a few men in raincoats. As for pursuits, it's a noun that contains a verb. What can you ever do with reality but chase it around? You can't expect to capture it in any final way because the thing keeps moving. Picture me then, butterfly net or pop gun in hand, flapping over the fields with the elusive subject flitting away into the distance or crouched behind the bushes in hopes of catching a glimpse. A glimpse of what? That's just it. You never know. She has such a wonderful way with words and I'm so excited to finish it. I don't really have that, that many essay collections and I really want to get hold of Atwood's The Tent because I read it a while ago and it's just pure poetry. It, so I thought this one would be a wonderful one to grab as well. There is also my Scottish Classics box set which I picked up from a local bookshop for about, ooh, £4? Published by, I can't see what word that Oh, yes, sorry. But it contains writings by Alistair Gray, James Kelman, Muriel Scott, Spark, Robert Burns, Sir Walter Scott, James Hogg and Robert Louis Stevenson. It also includes some really lovely postcard illustrations, each denoting something that happens within the books. So I am looking forward to it. I'm, I might just mount these on my wall anyway because they're just so pretty. There was Middlemarch by George Eliot, which, to be honest, I know next to nothing about. The short synopsis says Middlemarch, a study of provincial life published in 1871 to 1872, is set in the imaginary county of Loamshire during the years of unrest preceding the 1832 Reform Bill. With its complex plot, broad canvas and huge cast of characters, it has long been recognised as one of the few truly classic English novels. I have only heard good things. People have told me that it's fantastic and I should read it. No one's really been able to tell me why, but I'm a literature student. I have to give them a go at least once. Maybe it'll inspire me to do a dissertation, but my plan is to do that on Soteric. There is also the Daily Telegraph books, Learn Latin and Learn Ancient Greek by Peter Jones. Now, these are far from a comprehensive Latin course, but it's, it's good for beginners. And a beginner is what I am, especially in Ancient Greek, because the only bits of the language I've attempted to learn before are for etymological purposes, which I just do as a hobby, but I want to start reading it properly because classics are fascinating to me. Speaking of classics of all sorts, really, I recently bought some Penguin Little Black Classics and I am hoping to complete the set one day but not anytime soon. There is Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market and other poems and Goblin Market is a sheer joy. I may do a reading of this at some point because I just love it. There is the Free Town Dynasty Poets which I know next to nothing about, but it's a pastoral lyrical verse evoking the rural landscapes and peoples of 8th century China from three of its finest poets. Now, I've read next to nothing that comes from China, so I thought I'd pick it up and start learning. Plato's Socrates Defense, which I absolutely love. Socrates is on trial for corrupting the youth of the city of Athens, and this is the defence that he makes at court and the result of it is that he is sentenced to death and forced to commit suicide but it's just so beautifully worded and it has so many interesting points and my favourite little axiom of all time the wise man knows that he knows nothing there's Michel de Montaigne's how we weep and laugh at the same thing why does I say laugh? I say laugh unless I'm trying to make a point but it says that they are glittering essays by the renaissance master of the form exploring contradictions in human thoughts and actions well I already mentioned I've been looking to pick up some more essay collections and I am a big fan of renaissance writing there is Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels the communist manifesto which well if you can't guess what it's about from that title, it's a manifesto for the communists. The first one ever made, written in London by two Germans and published in Paris, it's very cosmopolitan. 
There is Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper and other uh, short pieces. Now, this is a fantastic exploration of um, mental health. It's just wonderful. I've spoken about it before in a Top 5 Wednesday video actually, so I'll pop the link there. There is Speaking of Siva, which is four medieval Hindu saints approach sex and death through riddle and enigma in this mystical devotional poetry. Now, again, I've read next to nothing from the Hindu faith at all. I don't even know what the holy book is called, if they have a holy book. But I'm interested in learning. There is The Madness of Cambyses by Herodotus, which is weaving factual accounts with colourful myth. The father of history tells the psychotic Persian king and his fateful death. Now, that's fascinating to me for a start. Herodotus got some really interesting stuff going, and psychotic, fateful, psychotic kings rather. Ooh, what could be more interesting than that? There is Leonardo da Vinci by Giorgio Vasari which is the first art historian explores genius and madness in Leonardo and other celebrated Renaissance artists. I have a big thing about da Vinci, one of my big idols. Possibly the greatest genius the world has ever seen, and possibly quite bad. To be fair, the two often go hand in hand. I've got a poem about that, I'll share it at some point. There is Gustave Flaubert's A Simple Heart. Flaubert's most famous short work meditates on the unexamined futile life of a servant and her beloved parrot. There, I have read few books that focus on the troubles of the working class because practically every piece of great literature focuses mostly around the lives of kings and monarchs and gods. Nothing that's so wonderfully normal as something like this may be. So I'm looking forward to it. There is Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Meek One, which is based on the St. Petersburg news report, Dostoevsky's searing tale of a man who drives his wife to suicide. Sounds like a fr un thriller. There is The Terrors of the Night by Thomas Nash, demonic horrors and spirits dreamt up by the most exuberant inventive prose writer of Elizabethan England. Well, who doesn't love demonic horrors? And there is C. P. of Harvey's, however do you say that name, Remember Body, which is moving sensual verses on nostalgia and desire by the masterful early 20th century Greek poet. Now, that's interesting because I have never read anything by any modern Greek writers. Well, I technically I have because I have a friend who is Greek and a writer, but she is not published yet. Her poetry collection should be out later this year, or at the end, start of next year. And I certainly intend to buy that one, but this would be interesting because as you may have noticed, the Greek books that I have read tend to be very, very old and, well, very grand. So I'm interested in finding out what this one's like. There is also another Penguin classic, but not a little black one, is Silas Marner by George Eliot. Wrongly accused of theft and exiled from a religious community many years before, the embittered weaver Silas Marner lives alone in Ravelo existing only for work and his precious hoard of money. But when the money is stolen and an orphan child finds her way into his house, Silas is given the chance to transform his life. His fate and that of the little girl he adopts is entwined with Godfrey Cass, son of the village squire who, like Silas, is trapped by his past. Silas Marner, George Eliot's favourite of her novels, combines humour, rich symbolism and pointed social criticism to create an unsentimental but affectionate portrait of rural life. So that's interesting. I mean, I didn't realise that George Eliot was in fact a pseudonym for a female writer called Mary Ann Evans. Interesting development, that. There is John Donne's The Complete English Poems, which I'm really looking forward to actually sitting down and reading properly. I love some of his stuff. I can't remember the name of the poem, but the one that inspired House Moving Castle and... Um, Stardust by Neil Gaiman, the one about a falling star. It's beautiful and I love it. And I hope the rest are just as good. And lastly, there is Thomas de Quinty's Confessions of an English Opium Eater and Other Writings. I've not read many books about addiction before. There was 000, which I got from, um, what, what's it called? Penguin Platform, the YouTube channel. But this one is from the perspective of an addict, which is fascinating. And 
just from that uh, quote here, opium gives and takes away. It ruins the natural power of life, but it develops preternatural paroxysms of intermittent power. Shows that this is probably going to be excellently written and quite fascinating. So let me know what you think. Are there any of those that are particularly fascinating to you? Have you read any of them? Or are there any that you would really like to read? I shall see you tomorrow for another part of Vlogmas. Goodbye.